Hi, everyone. Uh, so today's reading is One in Christ. Um, it says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So the sentence is quite long. So the next bit is, again, talking to the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. By now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one, sorry, uh, reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow, cit you are now fellow citizens with the, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is week six in our basic discipleship series. We said through this series we want to study what disciples do, how they act, and we also want to be clear on how we know that we are making disciples as a church and also how you know that you are being formed into a disciple. So we've said through this whole series that we feel like if we are clear about what a disciple looks like, then we can paint a compelling picture for what we all strive towards, and that can be a catalyst for growth in our church, because we want to see disciples being made. Kuliso said that earlier. Let me show you our discipleship journey once again. I'm going to do it in true Pauline fashion in one go, right? And see if you can follow with me. We are saying this every single week so that it becomes part not only of our language and not only of our thoughts, but that it becomes part of our behavior and our hearts, that it seeps deep into the soul, okay? So at Fellowship City, we say a disciple loves God and loves people. How? Well, a disciple knows God, a disciple commits faithfully, and a disciple gives generously. How do we do that? A disciple knows God through His Word, through encountering Him, and through worship. A disciple commits faithfully to transformation, that's the transformation of the Spirit in our lives, to God's people, to the mission of the church, and a disciple gives generously of time, of talents, and of treasures. How's that? So today we are going to spend time here. A disciple commits faithfully to the mission of the church. Bottom left. Are you with me? All right. Now, the mission of which church? The big C church, like the global church, or the small C church, the local church? The answer is yes. Both, right? So a disciple commits faithfully to the mission of the church. Let me, th let me show you our vision as Fellowship City. Here we go. Seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives in and through his transcultural church. That's what we live to see. That's what we chase. That's where we're headed. This is what we pray for. This is what we want. This is what we desire and long to see. Now, it can't be a Reino sermon if I don't add some highlights. <laughs> so let me show you some highlights in our vision statement. Can you believe it? God's kingdom. It's really important for us 
to have a grip on what God's kingdom is. Right? So God's kingdom is where God is the king, where he reigns, where he calls the shots. Transformed lives, we've spoken about that at length, but let me just say again that as people change, as they take on the image of Christ, as they live the abundant life that Jesus gives us, as they live the Spirit-led, Spirit-empowered life, they change. And if they change, the place changes. Do you guys see it? So God's kingdom comes by people's lives being changed. And that's why we say seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives. In, that's in here, and through, that's where you go, His transcultural church. Okay? Now, the word transcultural is important for us. We spoke about that earlier when Kuliso said this is what we're about. So we have a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. Sure. So we want this church to look like this community because then the gospel is reaching the whole community. Okay? But then also we say by the power of the gospel, we want to transcend that. We want to rise above it. We want to move past it and create one new community in Christ. Okay, phenomenal vision statement, Reino. Thank you very much. It sounds really cool. Is this biblical? Yes, it is. Let me show you. Here's a snapshot of Ephesians 2, where our teaching text comes from. Look at this. Transformed lives. New humans receiving a new purpose and new tasks. Humans that were dead, that are now alive. That is transformed lives. Do you see it? Now, these human beings, with their new purpose and tasks, have access to something. And that something is a new multi-ethnic family. God's kingdom, God's covenant family comes, check this, when all of those people live in peace. That's where the word transcend comes from. right? So we say we want to create one new community in Christ. A new unified humanity that lives in peace, which means we transcend our man-made boundaries. So even though we reflect, embrace, and enjoy it, right? Diverse family. We are all part of the same covenant family. So we rise above all of those man-made boundaries. Our vision statement is biblical, fam. It's important that you know that. Because it's not something that's just a good tagline for us to share or to put on a key holder. It's something that we are convicted of. This is the mission of the church. Now, here's the good news. The mission of Fellowship City, small C church, is the same as the mission of the church, big C church, because that's the mission of the big C church. Do you guys see it? Okay. Now, in Ephesians 2, Paul describes a hostile rivalry, right? It was deep and it was complex. And this rivalry was between Jews and Gentiles. Gentile is a word that means a non-Jew, right? So it was the Jews against everyone else. And that rivalry was deep because it was a religious rivalry, okay? I have a certain God, you have certain gods, my God is better than your God, you don't know my God, so therefore I am better than you. Do you guys see it? That's a real deep place to have rivalry with someone. It was definitely a cultural rivalry as well. Because the Jews had their rituals, they had their feasts, they had their ceremonies. And all the Gentiles had their rituals and their feasts and their ceremonies. And what happens? Ours is better than yours. No, ours is better than yours. No, ours is better than yours. And that's where the rivalry comes in. Okay? We spoke about all the positive things of our culture today, which I think is good. But the moment we hold on to cultural things as if it's better than a different culture, then we've got trouble because then it creates rivalry. And it was definitely racial. Definitely. Why? Because the Jews could boast of the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is in my veins. Right? So I have the right blood. You don't. And therefore my race, my skin color, and my language is superior to yours. It was part of their rivalry. Yet, Paul says in the teaching text that Muzi read to us, Through Christ, these two enemies, check this, have become family. What? Yes. Through Christ. Now we believe as a church that this can and should be the case. Here and now, today. Remember our definition of transcultural. 
We believe that we can move past these man-made boundaries. We planted this church because we believe that this is what God wants in Centurion and beyond. When we planted this church, we said to each other, there's a lot of churches in Centurion, and we praise God for all of them. It needs one more. And the one that it needs is a transcultural church. So that's our mission, fam. In our own words, spelled out to you. Or if we want to use the words of the slide, our mission is to be a new unified humanity that lives in peace. Sounds phenomenal now, doesn't it? I mean, if I would send a sheet around now or show you a QR code, you would probably sign up. I mean, who wouldn't? If you pitch to the transcultural church like this and you ask someone if they want to be part of it and they say no, the only legitimate question is, why not? Who knows how hard this is? This is hard. Thank you, Ben. I really do appreciate your hand. Fam, this is, this is difficult, church. It, it sounds phenomenal, and it is. And it's equally hard. Because it, is, it, it asks so much of us. And that's why we need to be faithful in our commitment to the mission of the church. That's what a disciple is. And what we want at this church is we want people who keep going when it's hard. We want people who keep going when it's hard, not because of our preaching or because of our worship or because of our programs, but because they believe that this is what God has called us to. A disciple is faithfully committed to the church. Okay, one question, three answers, and we'll be out. What do we need to know, understand, and believe to be faithfully committed to the mission of the church? Did you guys see that I got my Paul on? Even the question is long, right? What do we need to know, understand, and believe to be faithfully committed to the mission of the church? What we once were, what Christ has done, and what we have now become. What we once were, what Christ has done, and what we have now become. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, you did a, you did a great work, and you created family from, from enemies. And we know that it's through you and in you and by you. And Lord Jesus, we want to we wanna follow you in that. We don't want to disregard that as if it was in vain. We also don't want to think of the work that you did on the cross as something that only happened way back in the day. We want to think of this as something that you're still doing in us, among us, and through us. So I praise you for the opportunity that we have now to open up the Scriptures and to learn from you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate our minds, that you would illuminate the truth, that you would bring conviction of sin. That you would lead us and show us the way that you want to go. I pray, Lord Jesus, that I would only say what it is that you want me to say. In your name, amen. Let's look at the first one. I've got some highlights for you because it is such a long sentence. Okay? Look at verses 11 to 22 when we talk about what we once were. Remember in verse 11, remember in verse 12. You Gentiles, everyone who are not Jews, who is not Jews, are not Jews. And then uh, again in verse 12, you. Right? So he's speaking to a specific group of people and he's telling them to remember. Okay? What do they need to remember? Spontaneously, I want to say, remember who you are, because I watched Lion King a lot when I was kids. But that's actually not what Paul is saying. Okay, it just it came to me now. He says, you were separated from Christ. That means not part of it, not close to it. Put to one side, not in, but out. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise. God taking care of His people. God providing for them. God blessing them. God leading them. God promising things to them. God raising up people among them to show His will and to communicate His will. You have nothing of that. It's not yours. You alienated from it. Just think about that for a second. Like, what do you have? And you are strangers to the covenants of promise. No promise from God to you. Nothing. He won't bless you. He won't keep you. He won't be with you. He won't keep his side of the promise because he did make a promise with you. 
He made a promise with His people. And a covenant is a promise with a great price in which you promise to hold to your side of the deal. Paul says, no commonwealth for you. No promises. And therefore, look at the last part of verse 11. You had no hope. <laughs> you were without God. Hopeless and godless, fam. That's where they were. And Paul says, remember that. Would anyone sign up for that now? If I said, do you want to be separated, alienated, strangers, hopeless and godless? No one would sign up for that now. Now we can look at the scripture and go, <laughs> tough luck for them. Woo! How glad am I that I'm not a Gentile? Ah, oh, snap. Oh, I am a Gentile. Oh no, that counts for me too. Fam, before we met Jesus, we had the same tragic position. We were separated from God. We were separated from His people. But here's the good news. It's not that way anymore for believers. And if you're not a believer listening to me now, it doesn't have to be that way for you anymore. God decided to send His Son at the right time to pay for our sin so that the disunity and division and enmity between us could end. So that we could be reconciled to one another. So that our sin could be covered. And so that we could be in right relationship with God again and with each other. That's the good news. Now luckily Jesus just didn't just die. He also raised from the dead. Which means that death for us is not the end. It's just the beginning. Right? And Jesus is living a whole new life now. And we will follow Him into that life. And it's called eternal life. And all of that comes by faith. It comes by admitting, believing, and confessing. It's as easy as that. That's the good news. So I had bad news first, and Paul says, remember the bad news. Remember that is where you came from. But the good news is it's not like that for you anymore, and it doesn't have to be like that for you anymore. So if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that you are still in the same tragic, tragic position. And I want you to know that there is a way out. And that's called the gospel. If you do not believe in Jesus, this is still you. Strangers, aliens, separated. Why does Paul want the people to remember this? Well, fam, because if we continue to remember where we came from, then we will live with constant gratitude towards God and towards others. Right? I always use the words, we get to do this. It's a privilege to be part of this. Like when I look at Marie and I look at our kids, I say to each other, there was a time when I was alone. And now I'm not alone anymore. Like, I get to do this. I take in a position of gratitude. It's the same with this. I mean, fam, just think for a second. Do you remember your life before Jesus? Do you remember how it was? The other day I went for a run, sunrise, it was beautiful. I was coming up Jean Avenue, just on my way to turn into Louise. And I was like, <laughs> My life without Jesus was a dog show. And I was crying all the way down Louis Street for something that happened 19 years ago. You know what I mean? But I was so lost, fam. And then that turns into gratitude. And gives me great power to face that day. Do you know this? I have to ask you this. Do you know this? Do you remember this? And if you remember this, this is where you came from and the privileges that you have now. Have you told someone about this recently? Because that is a sign of gratitude. We tell people about things we found that we are thankful for. And that's one of the key things that keeps the flame of evangelism alive in our hearts. I found love. I found love. Can I tell you about it? Can I tell you about it? Can I tell you about it? Right? Marie and I decided to get married when I was still overseas. So we had to long distance date for two months. Up until the 11th of Jan, I don't think I told anyone in the United States about Marie. But after the 11th of Jan, until the 6th of March, like whoever would speak to me, I would go, listen, I just need to tell you that I'm going to get engaged and married when I go home. Her name is Marie. Her surname is Mostert. In Afrikaans, that's also Mustard, right? But I gave her a little nickname and people just go, okay, thank you, you know, overshare. But I couldn't, I couldn't keep quiet. Because I found love. And I want you to know, 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 because I'm thankful for it. Are you this thankful for the gospel? Because if you are, 
then you'll be sharing with other people. And other people will hear it, and other people also have the opportunity to come to faith. Fam, next step. Why don't you just ask someone to remind you of this every single day? Remind me, please, of what I once were, was. Whichever one it is. Maybe your next step is as simple as writing it on your mirror. Stick it on your fridge. Like, write it out, stick it on the fridge. Because where you get milk in the morning, may you be reminded of what you once were. Save it on your phone's background. Like, I understand the pictures of the Drakensberg is nice, but screenshot the verse, highlight that bad boy, and put it on the background of your phone. You will look at your phone, oh, well, where are we now? 1,500 times tomorrow. Something like that. I don't know. You need to know what you once were. Let's look at the second point. What Christ has done. Okay, don't be frightened. There's a lot of highlights in this portion of Scripture. The yeah but we'll work through them. Okay, stay with me. Let's go. To understand what Christ has done, I think we can use two, two subheadings. It's, He has brought us peace, and it is, He has made us one. Are you with me? Okay, so we're going to work through ordinances and laws and new and all that kind of stuff, but the main point of this portion is, Christ has brought us peace, and Christ has made us one. Okay, look at verse 14. He Himself is our peace. Okay, let's just stop there. Christ has brought peace in here. He hasn't brought peace out there. You guys see it? He's brought the opportunity or the possibility of peace out there, but where he brought peace was in here. Which means that the way to peace for the world is not going to come from the world. It's going to come from the church. Do I see that? We are the peacemakers. Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. It's our assignment to make peace. It's not the assignment of the United Nations and all other bodies you could possibly have to broker peace. It's the church's job. Because we know how to make peace. And we'll see that in the next portion of the scripture. I just want to ask you before we move on, do you know this peace? Like, do you know Jesus Christ as your peace? And do you know Jesus Christ as our peace? And do you know that unbelievably fulfilling, awesome feeling of, I am at peace with my people. I am at peace with my people. Because Christ himself is our peace. Are you with me? Okay. Let's go to Christ has made us one. And that's now all the way from verse 14b down to verse 17. So we're going to cover a big portion now. Okay, how has he made us one? Look at it, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. What does that mean? It means that from now on, right, when Jesus did what he did on the cross, when he broke down the dividing wall of hostility, he says it's not how you live that dictates who's in and who's out, but rather what I did. And who says yes to that? Do you see it? So it's not food. It's not drink. It's not circumcision. It's not festivals. It's not Sabbath. And all the etc. that comes with the laws and ordinances. What it is now is what Jesus did and who says, I'm in. That's the only separation there is now. And do you see that it says... That he might create in himself, in himself, not on our own, not without him, but rather while being intimately with him. Fam, that's the only way that we make peace with each other. It's the only way that the dividing wall of hostility breaks. It's the only way that we truly move past man-made boundaries is when we are intimately with Him because He created a new humanity in Him. We can't do it on our own. It's impossible. We can't run a reconciliation program. It won't work. We can't run a program for transculturality. It won't work. While we are intimately with Him, that's when he creates in himself this one new man. 
All other man-made mechanisms will lead to a disaster. But here, through him, it can happen. Okay, now look at the word new. So, that he might create, I'm in uh, the second sentence of verse 15, in himself, I already covered that, one new man in place of the two. Okay. That word new is fascinating. So, there are two Greek words that you can use to describe new. Okay. The one word is like this. This is the new iPhone. So, a iPhone already exists. This is a new version of it. It still does everything that iPhone used to do, but it's an upgrade. It just does it better and faster. That's one word that you can use in Greek to write new. Okay, here's the second one. Do you guys remember this bad boy? Hey? Why doesn't it want to work? Oh, I have to pull out the aerial. One phone call. Please charge battery. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. So that is a cell phone. And then came the iPhone. That's a new kind of phone. Do you see it? It's also new, but it's the first of its kind. It's not a continuation of a series. It's not an upgrade of something that was. It is brand spanking new. I mean, compare this to the Motorola I just showed you. Both are cell phones, but my word, this is something that can change the future. It's something brand new. Which word do you think Paul used when he said, create in himself one new man? He used the second word. He said, Jesus is creating in himself a new kind. Something that hasn't existed before. Something that has the ability to change the game. There was a church father called John Chrysostom. Here's what he said. He said, it is as if one took a statue of silver and a statue of lead, put them into a forge, and they came out with a statue of gold. Hey, 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 hey. I mean, John Chrysostom lived in the 400s. But that is a phenomenal sentence. That's the new humanity that Jesus created. And then look at the last part of 15. Peace again. Really important. And then look at verse 16. That he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. Woo! Okay, Paul. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why did you make it so complicated? Because I want you to see it as one thing. It's not different parts. It all happens at once. So reconciling us to God means reconciling us to one another. Do you see that? It's not two things. It's one thing. They all go together. And you can't separate them. And it happened through a peace treaty. A handshake. No! It happened through the cross. Thereby killing the hostility. Okay? So we are in peace with one another. We are reconciled both to God and to each other while we are part of one body because of the cross. That's what Paul says. And Paul doesn't say it cooled down the hostility. Paul doesn't say it took down the hostility a few notches. Paul says it killed the hostility. Dead, dead. Dead. So when we feel hostility coming up, we should say, Thou shalt not come up out of the grave. Be dead. Do you see it? Because Jesus killed it. John Stott, he said, God turned away His own wrath, and we, seeing His great love, turned away ours also. It's beautiful, huh? And then... At the latter part of verse 17, he uses the word peace again. And he came and he preached peace. Now look at it. Peace for who? For those who were far off and those who were near. I've got a note here. Side road for the Bible nerds. 
Shall I take it or shall I not? Yeah, let me take it. Okay. If you saw my Bible, man. Do you see there? It's interesting words. He came and preached peace. Who? And when did he preach peace? So, commentators debate this because some say it refers to Jesus' Jesus's earthly ministry of preaching. Right? So, when Jesus preached, he preached peace. Some other commentators say no, when Jesus was crucified, the crucifixion itself was a symbol of Jesus proclaiming peace, right? My hands are open, and I'm keen to embrace you if you would embrace me. Other commentators say no, his post-resurrection proclamation of peace, right? Peace be with you, as he breathed over the disciples. That's what Paul is referring to. And some other folks say it's the ongoing proclamation through the church of this peace. Which one is it? Yes. It's all of them. I really don't think that we have to limit Jesus' preaching of peace to any one of these. I mean, think about it. Jesus proclaimed the gospel of peace before the cross. He proclaimed the gospel of peace on the cross. He proclaimed the gospel of peace after the resurrection. And now, as followers of Jesus, we are still proclaiming His peace. Do you see it? Okay. And then... Look at the last part of verse 17. Both parties, you were far off and those who were near, everyone in peace with one another. I've heard this saying, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's beautiful, huh? Like everyone on level ground when they approach the cross. Those far off and those nearby. Christ has made us one. Let's look at verse 18. He has given us access to God. Ah, did you see the Trinity? Through Him, the Son, we have access in one Spirit, the Spirit, to the Father. It's right there. People sometimes debate, is the Trinity true? Is it a doctrine that we can still hold to? Dead. It's right there. I mean, it's impossible to argue with that now, isn't it? So look at that. He's given us access to God through Jesus. And He's given us access to the Father in the Spirit. Beautiful. That is the access that we have. Jesus Christ died so that all the isms in the world could die with Him. Do you guys understand that? Like, done with all the isms. Isms among believers can't be justified, and it must be resisted. Not only towards each other, but also towards anyone outside the church. And fam, let's be honest, in a church like ours, in a country like ours, in a city like ours, racism is still one of the biggest and most prevalent isms. Not yet. Not in the church. Big C church and small C church. Not according to Jesus and not according to the gospel. We have to be very, very clear. It is our mission to be this which Jesus created. Diversity in the church is a, it's a glorious demonstration of the work of Christ. I mean, think about it. In human terms, if I look at you, why on earth would you get along? Well, because Jesus. You know what I mean? In human terms, we shouldn't get along. But according to the gospel, we should. Because that's what Jesus did. And when we celebrate this, I think it gives us a compelling picture of heaven. It demonstrates this one new man. Let me show you what, what, what one new man looks like a little bit further ahead in the story of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 10. This is John. He's seeing something, and he's writing down what he's seeing. And he's looking into the heaven so that he could be strengthened, and that he could strengthen those around him to know where they are headed. And he says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, worshipping together and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb this is what Christ has done 
And we are a foretaste of that when we are the church that God has called us to be, fam. So let me ask you, are there isms in your life that you need to declare dead today? Do you need to make peace with anyone? Do you need to ask for forgiveness from anyone? We need to know, understand, and believe what we once were, what Christ has done. Let's land here. What have we now become? Now look at it. You are no longer, but you are. And then he describes what they are. Okay? So, citizens and members of God's household. It's not random. It's built on a firm foundation which are not only the apostles and the uh, prophets, but also Christ Jesus himself. He's the cornerstone. And then we actively participate in this. We are also being built into this dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, let's get our Bible nerd on for the last time. Paul uses in these four verses, 19 to 22, he uses three with or together words. Do you guys see it? Citizens with. That's the one. Joined together, verse 21. And the third one, built together, verse 22. Those words that Paul uses has got the prefix in Greek of sin and sim. So S-Y-M and S-Y-N. What word do we spell S-Y-N? Odyssey, sink. That's where we get the word sink from this iphone and this garment are synced with one another they work together in beautiful harmony and what is here is here and what is here is here do you guys see that so paul says we are all synced up not only to christ but also to other christians that is our identity we are in sync and that ain't no lie Baby, bye, bye, bye. Okay, 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 okay. I just couldn't resist it, you know what I mean? I still enjoy Justin Timberlake's two-minute noodle here. I really do. Okay. So what are we? What have we now become? We've become citizens of God's kingdom. That means we have rights. We have privileges. We have protection. We have provision. We don't have to look over our shoulder, right? We get everything that comes with citizenship of that kingdom. And then I want you to see, it doesn't say we became members of the sports club. Or members of Checkers 60. Or members of my school card. It's way more than that. Okay? We become members of God's family. A family is a loving community. A family is where you are known and where you know others. I mean, think about this, fam. If you want to know anything about me, just ask Marie and my kids. Why? Because I spend the most time with them. And even though I try and pretend, my worst side will come out when I am with them. That's a family. And that's the way that it should be in the church. Now look, fam, I understand that you can't be like that with 100 or 200 people. No human being can, but you can be like that with two people, or with three people, or maybe if you are extremely extroverted like me, ten people, then it gets fun. But you have to be known, you have to know your family, because this isn't just a sports club or a loyalty program, it's a family, and it says we are built on something that's solid, something that's bigger than us, and do you see, once again, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, it's in him and it's intimate with him. And what have we now become? Well, we've become stones in God's dwelling place. Where did God dwell? He dwelt in the garden and it was awesome. He didn't have beef with his people. And then he dwelt in the tabernacle, which was also awesome, but there was beef between him and his people. So if you wanted to go into the tabernacle, here's what you did. Stop. Whoa. Do not cross this line. You are dirty, sinful, and impure. You will not come to holy, pure, and clean. 
you need to do something first before you have access. The temple was exactly the same, right? You couldn't just waltz into the temple. Then God dwelt in Jesus himself and he showed us his glory full of grace and truth. Anyone could touch him. Anyone would go to him. But the moment you encountered him, you changed. Some didn't. I really feel for them. But most did. And then after all of that, God then decides to make his dwelling place in us. Come on fam, what a shift. Like through the outpouring of God's spirit, he stays in me. What a privilege. And not only does he stay in me, now all of a sudden he uses me as a carefully shaped building block to build his temple, his dwelling place. And each new member, a carefully shaped building block into his temple, the place where he chooses to stay. Fam, we need to elevate our view of the church. The church gets battered for many things. Some of it right and some of it wrong. Sometimes we lose, we lose interest in the church as if it's supposed to be a place where I have a lack of time on a Sunday. And if I don't have a lack of time, then I just don't go anymore. What? That's not the church. The church is God's temple. It's His dwelling place. It's where He chooses to live. If I ask someone about you, tell me about that person. Would they mention this identity at all? Would they mention this reality at all? That's just the baptismal bath running empty. Like your bath at home. It's got a little hole and it goes... It'll get better as it continues. So don't worry about that. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's spilling. If I ask someone, tell me about Sanaba. Would they say, ooh, Sanaba is a child of God. We know that. We can see that. Sanaba is someone that, that's fitting for God to stay in. We can see that in her life. Would you say that about yourself? Like if I would ask you, tell me more about you. Would you say, I am a dwelling place of God. I'm part of His temple. Like He's chosen me. He's built His dwelling place with me. And He rejoices by living and dwelling inside of me. We need to take who we have become very seriously if we are going to commit faithfully to the mission of the church. We spoke about what we once were, we spoke about what Christ has done, and we spoke about what we have now become. Let me show you our vision again. It's as biblical as they come, fam. It's seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives in and through His transcultural church. That's our call. That's our assignment. That's our privilege. And disciples are people who say, I faithfully commit to that. Do you? Will you? Amen. Before we sing a song in response and close out, um, I want to pray. I want to pray for us this morning. Because I realize, fam, that without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we won't be able to live this out. And I want to pray for that this morning. I want to pray for all of us to be empowered anew and to experience that power anew so that we, we can become what God has called us. Can I ask for all of us to stand? And I want to ask you to, to take a posture as we end out this series. I mean, guys, we've got one sermon left. That's us. Then that's 2023 gone. I want you to open up your palms and to be in a posture of receiving and I want to pray for you and I want to pray for myself. Come Holy Spirit and move among us. Do a work in us of transformation, of making us more and more like Christ the Son. Bring fruit forth in our lives, Holy Spirit. Change us inside out empower us to live this life that you've called us to remind us daily of what we once were remind us daily of what christ has done remind us daily of what we have now become have your way in us holy spirit we don't only surrender an hour or two each sunday to you 
We don't only surrender five or ten or fifteen minutes each day to you. We don't only surrender a dinner time, thanks for the food, prayer to you. We surrender everything to you, Holy Spirit. Take it all, from top to bottom, inside and out. Everything that you've given us. And take us on this journey to be the church, big C, and to be the church, small C. Transform our lives, Lord Jesus, so that we can see the kingdom come. And I want to pray that you do this in this church and through this church. Let us be at peace with one another. Let us be a family. Let us be a place known for love and for holiness. We receive your power, Holy Spirit. And we need it so badly. Do in us what you want to. We pray that in your name. Amen. Thank you.